chapter 15 of Romans says, We who are strong are to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give, your, give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it, as it is written therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles I will sing hymns to your name again it says rejoice O Gentiles with his people and again praise the Lord all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you people. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, and one who will arise to rule over the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Romans has, the, the, the letter to the Romans has been said to be the greatest letter from the Apostle Paul. It's been said to be his magnus opus or his greatest achievement. And that's where we get justification by faith. Um, that's Romans 3.21 in Romans 1 16 to 17 the, the just shall live by faith alone so it's a great letter but a lot of people stop reading Romans in chapter 8 why is that? because chapter 8 1 to 8 teaches us a lot of doctrine a lot of what God has done for us and that's good but then Paul jumps into something else. 9 to 11, he jumps about Israel. He's wanting to talk about Israel. He's wanting to explain why Israel is still part of God's people. Why Israel is still counts. And then from 12 to 15, he starts talking about something else. He starts talking about how we live with one another. And that's why you see a lot of people who know a lot of Bible, yet are always in strife, are always fighting against each other. Because a lot of people just read up to chapter 8, and that's it. Oh, I know everything I need to know. But then Paul goes to another part of Christian life. Christian life doesn't only reside in what we know about Jesus, which is very important. But also deals how we live with one another. And Paul starts saying that we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. In Greco Roman culture, the weak are supposed to conform to the strong. And you see this also in today's culture. You see that the, that the strongest nations, the nations that have a lot of power, both with money or with guns, military, they are the ones who tell smaller nations what to do. They are the ones who impose sanctions or impose agreements to lesser nations. And right now, we, are, we Australia, we are dealing with East Timor, 
You know, we're in, in Europe trying to finalize this deal. And why, do East, the, why did the East Timorese take Australia to The Hague Court of Justice? Because they felt that because Australia is so powerful that they were getting a just deal. And sometimes Australia, that's how it is. That's how we are here. We tell all the little islands what to do. So Paul is saying the opposite. That those who are strong are to bear with the failings of the weak so not to please ourselves. Who has been in the Boy Scouts here? Nobody. One thing that I learned, I, I had never been in the Boy Scouts. <laughs> this is the disclaimer. I had never been in the Boy Scouts. But one thing that uh, I was taught by somebody who was in the Boy Scouts was that they always walk as fast as the slowest walker. They walk as fast as the slowest walker. So they don't leave anybody behind. And sometimes in the Christian life, I, I, I've, been, um, I've been guilty of this. I want people to, to walk as fast as I do. Come on, you should, you should be, you, you, you've been a Christian for five years. You should know this. But maybe they're not as interested as I am to, to, to remember these things. Maybe they have something more interesting in, in their jobs or in their life that they want to know, that they want to have in their head. That's why you find Paul repeating and repeating and repeating the same thing all over again. We who are strong have to bear with the failings of the weak. And who are the weak? You know, the weak in Romans are those who want to keep on with the food laws, Jewish food laws. That they think that they're better because, oh, we, we keep with the law, so, so we are more in tune with the, with the scripture than you guys. We pray, we, we keep these certain days for God. But Paul calls them weak. Verse 2. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Each of us, we the strong. Usually in churches, because he's talking about a church. That's what, let's talk about church. He's talking about the Roman church, the church in Rome. The one who has greatest charisma. That's the one that everybody follows. The one that has the greatest um, influence in the church. That's the one everybody follows. But Paul doesn't say that. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good. Not to please to gain something from the neighbor, but to for something that will build him up, says, to build him up. Some people are people pleasers, you know. They want to please everybody, oh, because I want to please you so I can get something out of you. And we're talking about church matters here. If you do something for someone in church, are you doing it because you want to build him up, build her up, or, you want, or you're thinking, well, today for me, tomorrow for me. Uh, today for me, and tomorrow for you. But the secret is that today for you, today for you and tomorrow for me, that's how he says, sorry, I said, I said it backwards. <laughs> today for you and tomorrow for me. That's what people say. No, today for you and tomorrow for you, and I always do something for you because you're my brother in Christ. So we are not called to be people's pleasers. We are called to build up people. See, if you go back to, four, to chapter 14, verse 19, it's, it'll be very close to where you are. He says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual, mutual edification. Listen to this. This is very important for church life. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to strife, to schism, to show that I'm right. No. That leads to peace. Do we do that in churches? And let me remind you again. This is talking about church. Talking about church life. Do we do that? Do we do this? Do we do our best to keep the peace in the, in the church? Do you love 
God so much that you don't want to destroy the people in the church. And he doesn't say this because we're good people. He calls us in verse 3 to follow what Christ does. He says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Apparently, maybe there were insults in this church, in the Roman church, in the church of Rome. There were insults. People were insulting one another. And when somebody insults you, you want to get back to them. How dare you say that about me? But what does the Bible say? Jesus took it in. And the Bible says in Isaiah that he was like a lamb, quiet, going to the slaughter. And sometimes people will see you as a weak person. Because you didn't stand up for yourself. Oh, this guy doesn't stand up for himself. This woman doesn't stand up for So we're going to go over them. No. Jesus is, Jesus, people thought that Jesus didn't stand up for himself. Remember when, when, the end, when, when Peter said, we have, we have um, swords. And remember he, that he, he cut the servant's ear. And what did Jesus say? Stay back. I can ask my father for a legion, for 12 legions of angels, but why should I? And sometimes if somebody says to you something, or says something against you, may gossiping about you in church, you just want fire to come down from heaven and burn that person. And you know how I know? Because I have <laughs> those feelings sometimes. But then I have to remind myself all the time. For even Christ did not please himself. Am I here to please myself? Or am I here to please God and my brothers and sisters? That's the, that's the main question about coming to church. Because people come and say, Oh, we didn't sing well this morning. Oh, um, the preacher wasn't that interesting this morning. I didn't get anything from church. That's not the main point. The main point of coming to church is what did I give this morning to my brothers and my sisters? Thus, if everybody will come thinking like that, then church will be the best place ever, the kingdom of God. Repent because the kingdom is near and the kingdom is among us. But sometimes we are bludgers. That's what we are. We want all the benefits from the kingdom, but we don't want anything back. We don't want to give anything back. That's what I think that jo uh, Joseph Kennedy, the president, said. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ask not what you can do, what the church can do for you, but what you can do for your church. For your brothers and sisters. For everything, verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. And this is, the, this is Paul now getting into the main point. Because you're going to see hope again at the end of this passage that, I, that we read. So Paul says that the scripture was written in the past to teach us, to remind us. That's what I started saying, that the little testimony that I said about passing the faith to our children. God has been faithful to me. I cannot turn my back to God because he has been faithful to me. He promised me that I would come to Australia without paying a cent, and he did. He promised me a family, and I have it. He promised me when I was 14, he promised me, I'll, I'll make a pastor out of you. I said, no, I don't want to. <laughs> That's right. I, want to. I, I wanted to, but at the same time, I didn't want to. But he said, and I'm going to do it. And he has done it in other ways that I never expected. God's been faithful. And why do we believe God that is faithful? Because we read in the scriptures that he has been faithful to his people, Israel. 
He has been faithful blessing them, and he has been faithful um, br- huh? punishing. punishing them. Yes, that, that, that's the one thing. That sounds bad, but yeah. that, that's all the word around it. <laughs> I was trying to get around it, but he has been faithful blessing them, and he has been faithful punishing them. We, 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 we sometimes don't like it. We, we like to, to have all the, all the blessings of God. Oh, yes, he blessed me in this, he blessed me in that. But then when he says, but God says, you are my child, then we're all punished. If we don't punish our children, we're bad parents. So when God punishes us, oh, Lord, I, I'm, I'm your child. Why are you doing this to me? Well, because you're my child. And I like how the old King James says in Hebrews, that whoever God takes as a son, he punishes. But in the old King James, in the, in the, in the Spanish old version, you know what, he, what, 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 what the meaning of, of the old version is? That Remember those places where they put you in the Middle Ages and they put you like this and they start flogging you? That's what it means in the Spanish. Whoever God takes as a son, flogs. He flogs them. I don't know if you ever were belted by your mom and dad. I was. <laughs> and I can say thank you mom because although she maybe she overdid it sometimes but, but thank you mom because you love me it's, it's very difficult to understand that God loves you when he punishes you, punishes you but he does so everything that was written in the past was written to teach us and I just like to read you this verse uh, from um, 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 3.15 2 Timothy 3.15 and, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Rebuking. See, we... we we always say, oh, when I read the scriptures, I feel this thing very nice inside me because it's telling me how much Jesus loves me. I feel this, this, this burning in the bosom. And you know who, who Mormons say that when they read scripture, when God's talking to them, they feel a burning in the bosom. So a lot of Christians always also say that. Oh, I feel this burning in the bosom when I hear scripture. And I always ask, okay, does the, the scripture also rebuke you? Does it, does it correct you? Verse 17, so that the men of God or the women of God may be truly equipped for every good work. So that's why scripture is so good to us, so important to us. And there's another verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, that actually Paul is, is, is almost repeating himself what he's saying there. But the scriptures are there to give us endurance and encouragement. So that we may have hope. In verse 5. May the God who gives endurance. See he, he, he repeats the same words. And, and like I've been saying. The times that I've been here. Always pay attention. When, when the writer of the scripture. Repeats and repeats the same thing. He's, he wants you to understand. He just said the words. Endurance and encouragement. And then he goes again to say it in verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement. Give you a spirit of Unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. We all follow Christ Jesus in here. You don't see anybody just, just by themselves. Oh yeah, well, Craig is part of this church, but he's following Jesus over there. Or, or Ian is, fa- is following Jesus, uh, is part of the church, but he's following Je- uh, Jesus somewhere, somewhere else. No, we all follow Jesus together. We are one body. So that with one heart, verse 6, and one mouth, so that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With one heart and one mouth. So when God hears our praises, even though we may not have a good voice, even though we may be singing out of tune, when God is looking at us from heaven, or maybe even from this uh, city, 
He is looking at us as one body, as one mouth, as one voice. Because whatever comes, if I know my wife, I'm going to say it from the heart. Yeah? <laughs> I love you. So one, the heart and the mouth go hand in hand. The same thing happens when we praise God. The mouth and the heart must go hand in hand. We don't want anybody here who says, Oh, I love the Lord! But they don't mean it in the heart. Or when we say, To God be the glory, somebody may say, No, 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 no. We don't want that. <laughs> we don't want anybody saying, No, 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 I don't want to give God the glory. We want to say the same thing. We want to feel the same thing in the church. It's very difficult, my friends. Because if you're married, or being married, you know how difficult it is sometimes to feel the same and to say the same things as husband and wife. It's very difficult. But God will give you a spirit of unity. Do you, have you ever prayed for our church here to, to have a spirit of unity? Lord, give us a spirit of unity, please, so we can stay together. If you haven't, there you go. So that with one heart and one mouth, you may glorify the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, verse 7. And the NIV puts it backwards. Then accept one another. That's what uh, is written. Then accept one another. Because of this, then accept one another. Why? Because you have to bear each other's um, failings. Because you have to encourage one another. Because you have to be in unity. Then accept one another. Just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So when I accept somebody in church, a lot of people have, see, outside the church, my brothers and sisters, if you don't think like them, if you don't talk like them, if you don't follow their lifestyle, people don't accept you. That's why you have clubs. That you have footy club, and that's why you have a footy club. I don't know who you follow, the bombers and, and the cats. If you're part of, a, if you're part of the cats footy club in Geelong, you're not gonna go to the other club and, and have communion and talk how good the cats are. <laughs> They'll kill you. But in, in Christianity, and this is gonna sound a bit, uh, a bit weak for some people, but in Christianity I can come to this church, to the Presbyterian church, this is what, this is what God wants. I can come to the Presbyterian church and say, to God be the glory. And everybody will say, Amen. And then I can go to the United Church and I can say, to God be the glory. And everybody will say, the same thing. Amen. But sometimes, due to our sin, we don't do it. Imagine how, how difficult it is for our churches to be together. Imagine how difficult it is for us to be together here. So why do we have so many denominations and so many things? Because, because of our sin. Because we're not in unity. But it's very telling that when the church is persecuted, all those differences fall to the ground and people unite. Go to Syria. They all united. They're all united because they've been killed. So accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. So God became a servant. And let us again read something that Paul writes in, in, in Philippians. And if you go with me, I, li I, like, I like to read it with you. Philippians chapter 5. Um, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, let's read from um, 
for chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. So he's asking the Philippians also to be of one mind. Having the same love, be one in the Spirit. Listen to this. Paul is saying the same thing to the Philippians when he said to the Romans, because every single church has issues. Paul didn't write to the perfect church. All those congregations have issues. We have issues here. There's issues in Kerang. There's issues in Pyramid Hill. There's issues in Kundruk. There's issues in Baram. There's issues everywhere. Being like one, like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfishness, ambition, or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. <gasps> But I've been in this church for ages. How can this new guy be better than me? Remember the parable? Remember the parable of, of the workers? The last ones, they got the same payment. Or I know more than him. I went to theological college. I learned a lot from people who never been in theological college. Verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who, and this is a, actually, this is a little hymn, who, who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Listen, obedient, and there he says, he became a servant to the Jews, obedient, to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Glory, glory. If we are united, if we have ourselves, it will be not for my glory, it will be for the glory of God the Father through Jesus Christ. Do you want to glorify God? And going back a bit on Presbyterianism, one big thing about Calvin is that he wanted to live a life for the glory of God. But the glory of God doesn't mean that I'm going to put everything, everybody down so I can put myself up. Oh, I have the best doctrine. I have the best life. No. It's to humble ourselves. That's when, the glo when God is glorified. What a contrast, my brothers and sisters. What a contrast. And I will read this quick because I have to finish quick. But Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, O you Gentiles, and praise to him, O you people. The issue in Romans was that the Gentiles were looking down at the Jews in the congregation. They said, oh, these Jews, you rejected God. You rejected the Messiah, so you're, you're doing bad. You're wrong. But Paul is saying, look, God promised the Jews that you were going to be praising God along with them. That's what he's saying. But I like the last one. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will raise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. When we read the root of Jesse in Isaiah, what happened is that the Jews have been taken to Babylon. They have no hope to have another king. But then Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will raise to rule over the nations. But they just be conquered by the Babylonians. And this is the root of this. Once the tree has been cut to the root, it's never going to come up. Or does it? But what the Bible says is that this, off, this, uh, this spring, this offshoot, will be stronger. And look at the picture. I like this picture because 
all the things you know, we have experienced fire here in the country, everything's burned and, and this thing has been cut down. The tree has been cut down, cut down to the root. Yet, there's still hope. That's what Isaiah is saying. There's still hope. There's still hope. And what does the Bible say? The Gentiles will hope in him. This is what's saying what the, the root of Jesse. Who's the root of Jesse? Jesus. So when there's no hope, God makes hope. And let us finish today. May the God of hope fill you, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We want hope. Do we hope that the government will, do, will take care of us? Do we hope that the governments of the world will, will fix the financial crisis or do what's happening in Japan and in China, you know, that they're not backing down? Do we hope that they will fix it? Where is our hope, my brothers and sisters? Our hope is in Jesus. And this is what the Lord said in John 14, 27. Peace I live with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Where is your hope for this church? Even if we get a new pastor. Is your hope in the new pastor that he will do great things? We pray that he will, that God will use him to do great things. That's our hope. That God will use him. That, will, that God will bring people to our church here that will help. And the ones that are being faithful, that they can lead them in into the church. That's the hope. This may be the last time I preach to you, but I want to leave you, my brothers and sisters, with the hope that Jesus offers you and offers this church. Let us pray.